Smashamaniacs. Gearheads. Welcome back to the Geo Gearheads episode 359. This is a weekly show about geocaching and other location based games. And as usual, I'm Daryl W4 with Chris of the Northwest. Welcome back. I'm the weekly part. W E A K L Y. <laughs> it's been one of those weeks already, huh? Oh, man. Hey, it's good to be back. You know what? Thursday night without Geo Gearheads is you know like a wednesday night or or a friday night yeah it could be a friday night friday night we usually you know go to costco so wednesday night yeah. though would be the uh, geocaching uh, podcast yeah, yeah yes it is i i don't doubt that no I've yet so to, yeah I've yet to listen to it live it, so a night without the geo gear hoods could be a night without uh or with the uh, uh geocaching with the podcast yeah. So there the you go. Cast. Uh, Scott but it's the good pod to be back. Burks. Yeah, it's good to be back and to see you again because it feels like it's actually been like a month since uh, we were last doing this. It does seem uh, like it's been a while. I know, and I, I don't even remember what last week's show was. How bad is that? Uh, but tonight is a show that many people have been waiting for, which is a GPSR versus smartphone show. They are going to be a little disappointing because this is not going to be a debate so much as a discussion and oh we no bring i'm on... gonna make it a debate i'm sorry to interrupt i know i shouldn't you're talk gonna over argue you with yourself i am going to make it a debate okay you're gonna you're gonna debate with yourself yes okay I, that should be I usually win and and lose oh <laughs> well, you have to do both right but we we decided we have to get uh limax on as our uh, resident gps expert welcome back limax Great to be back. And thanks for joining us. I want to start off with a, a message that we got from uh, Mark of Obeep, which is also back now. Very happy to see that. And there are so many geocaching podcasts that have come back in the last I couple know. of months. Yeah, there's there's it's two wonderful. of them. It's two yeah. of them. But, uh, what is that? Like 20, 25% of the uh, geocaching podcasts have come back. Yeah, I, well, I want to say there are five main English-speaking uh, geocaching podcasts. So now there are seven. Yeah, well, there's two or three in uh, non-English speaking Europe, and I think there's still one down in. Uh, um, oh, where was it? It's it's the islands in. in I don't want to say the Caribbean, but somewhere you know, it's one of the Spanish speaking yeah, islands. islands. Was that what it was? That's Puerto Rico, isn't it? I don't remember. In any case, let's yes. say yes. There's, I, I'm happy because there's more geocaching podcasts. I'm unhappy because I don't have time to listen to them all anymore. Exactly. But Mark of Obeep messaged that uh, uh, he, well, this is something that I think is really interesting and kind of goes against a lot of what uh, uh, we might think about. He says, now we're in the realm of 1,000 pound plus smartphones. I'm considering going back to a GPSR or buying a very cheap Android phone slash secondhand Apple just for caching when I go. The workflow of using a GPSR is a little bit more, but that's still better than damaging or losing that pretty slab of glass Apple has hooked me up. He is buying very heavy smartphones. I know. Thousand pounds. Yes. Wow. And I think the reason he's doing that is to avoid the damage. Because if right, it's if that he heavy, he can't, he can't lift it, it up to drop right. it. Well, he's got a crane to use, doesn't he, with it? Well, yeah, he does work construction. Oh, there you go. Anyway. <laughs> no, I, I completely agree with him with these high-end, expensive phones that, yeah, you know, geocaching can be rough on a phone. It really can. Yeah. But at the yeah, same it, time, aren't these high-end phones also uh, more damage-resistant and more water-resistant than ever? I was just going to bring that up, that they have finally caught on to making the phones more resistant to that damage so i'm excited that we've got that however he's not wrong that it's a, a very expensive device to be taking out and losing 
one of the nice things, at least in the US though, is we do have a lot of options for accidental damage protection. Mm -hmm. You don't get that with the GPSRs. Well, that's you, true. You, you don't get accidental. Right, right. So if you lose it, if you damage it accidentally, you're going to be paying for that outright. However, the repair cost, if you have to pay for uh, like a screen replacement, exceeds the cost of your low cost GPSRs. Right. Well, I know with less. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I say with the Magellan, I actually did break the screen on it with my Explorist. Uh, unfortunately, it was on the first day of a, um, a, a week in uh, Massachusetts, so I was without a phone, uh, without a GPS for the rest of the week. But um, it was still under warranty, so they replaced it for free. I had to give them a credit card number, you know, just to cover cover in case it didn't return it. But uh, I, you know, they sent me out a new unit. So there That's are still awesome. some warranties. I don't know if Garmin Garmin does something like that. I'm kind of well, think they don't because they're the only ones around, but. Yeah, well, for the the accidental damage kind of stuff, typically they don't cover that. That's awesome that they did, and a lot of places used to do that. Yeah, but with the expense and the complexity of these new units, and the susceptibility to damage, especially with the capacitive touch stuff, it's just not something that you see very often. No, yeah, this was, uh, this of course is a resistive touch and let's see, this is back in 2012, I want to say, I mean, it's whenever, it's whenever it's, it was soon after I had lost the, uh, Explorers GC by accidentally leaving it in a cache. So, Oops. yep. Now, so nice swag REI has fun. a very, yep. REI has a very liberal return policy. You may be able to get a quote unquote replacement that way. Maybe. But uh, resistive touch wasn't that a Phil Collins song? That was Invisible Touch. Oh. <laughs> okay. So we're here tonight to talk about the differences and possibly the benefits between GPSR and smartphone. Now this is the second time we've done this, and uh, Limax, you weren't with us the first time, were you? I was not. I was. Uh, let's see. I couldn't even make the chat that day. I was. Um, I, I think we had uh, Scott Burks and Land Monkey. Yeah, it was well, Scott Burks. Had to do it twice. Monkey. Yeah, and you had to do it twice. I, th I might have been around the. F no, I wasn't even around the first time. That's right. We broke the internet that day. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I was probably off doing. Who knows what I was off doing? I can't remember <laughs> what. But that. Oh well, gosh, that would have been twenty. Yeah, it probably would have been twenty seventeen, wouldn't it? So yeah, I think I know what I was doing. Never mind. Well, gentlemen, let's start off by uh, listing the devices that we actually use when we go out caching. Not all the ones in your inventory, Daryl, but just the ones you actually use. Yeah, that would take a little too long. <laughs> That's why I had Especially because I don't even clarify. remember what I have. So, Daryl, what, what do you cache with as far as GPSR and phone? Well, to be honest, I really don't use a GPSR anymore. I... I I take my uh, eTrex 30 with me sometimes, expecting to use it, and I never do. You know, I'll turn it on. It just dangles around my neck. I love the unit. I really want to use it, but the fact is the iPhone with Cashly is just so nice and easy to use, especially now that it has the app on the watch to give me those uh, reminders as to how far the cache is as I'm walking long distances that I just don't even use the GPS anymore. How about you, Limax? Um, my main device actually is my, my iPhone eight with Cashly. Uh, although supplemental to that, I've got a GPS, a uh, Garmin Nuvi in the car that I load up with caches a lot of the time. Um, I use that to get close to the cache and then I pull out the phone to do the rest. And my Magellan Explorist 510 still makes the trip with me. And if I feel I'm not getting a good reading off of my iPhone for whatever reason, I do switch over to that and see if I can't do something with it. And I still do have some places around here where there is no cell phone coverage if I get up into the hills. And there I really do need to rely on the GPSR. 
on my uh, Magellan. You know, we we won't talk about the other device I've got that's a brick. <laughs> yeah, I have one of those as well. The uh, we'll talk about it a little bit the Oregon uh, seven hundred or seven fifty is mine, and I think you have the seven fifty as well. I have the seven fifty as well. Yes. Yeah, it's so much promise, but it it I just can't make it actually work well. Well, Tick Magnet in the chat wondered if you got it working. So we, Tick Magnet, we acknowledge your question, but we're going to hold off. We're going to build that suspense a little bit longer before we tell you what really happened there. Uh, well, now, Chris, I want to hear what you actually use, but then I want to go into a comment from uh, GSM Times 2. Uh, I use, of course, an iPhone. Uh, currently, I upgraded to an 8 Plus. Uh, I hit a 6 Plus. 6s plus a 6 plus for so long and that uh, served me well but uh, needed to upgrade so uh and i have an oregon 600 now that's not a current model but it same form factor as the 700 pretty much the same software as the 700 so yeah and unfortunately uh, my uh, 30 is no longer uh, modeled at uh, garmin cells but they do have the 30x which is basically the same thing with a few niceties added. Mm -hmm. But the comment that I wanted to mention from GSM Times 2 is that he said he uses a uh, Garmin Nuvi uh, to get the uh, directions to the cache, and he has uh, the phone on to get the satellite view to see where to park. And that's something I did want to bring up as one of the reasons why I do everything on the iPhone with Cashly and just about every app I know on iOS and on Android, you can jump out into a mapping program, whichever one you usually like is going to be supported. CarPlay in iOS 12 now supports Google Maps. Google Maps supports satellite view on the head unit. So I can do navigation from the cache with driving directions in Google Maps on the head unit. I love that. That has nice. made uh, caching so much nicer. And again, it's all in that one unit. So it's just boink, 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 and you're there. You don't have to go toggling between. You don't have to load up all these different units. So Zero. it's a convenient factor. Yes. The two of you must live in an area that has no trees. <laughs> because that's <laughs> the problem I've got is the fact that I look at the satellite view and all I see are trees. Have you oh, been I to see, Washington State? I see a lot of the trees. <laughs> but for the navigation... You can usually see the uh, path through the trees, which is nice. But for the navigation in the car, I like being able to do that so I can see the parking lot because there's rarely trees covering the parking lot. Mm, right. Okay. So yeah. You get to the trailhead, you know, parking lot where you can start your. your right. Uh, I'm looking for the parking as I'm driving to it. And that's, that's where that comes in handy because so many times the cache is near the road behind it. So the navigation wants to take you there rather than to the actual parking lot. Right. And Chris, I was actually referring to Daryl and GSM times two. I know that you live in Washington. I know what it's like there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, it's like I was uh, caching in Danville last Sunday along the, uh, the Iron Horse Trail. And that was tricky because, I mean, my newbie would try to lead me then, of course, onto the trail itself. And for some reason, motor cars aren't allowed on it. Well, they are once. Once. But, you know, it was, it was, do I have parking right there by the, by the access? Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Let's, let's Darryl? actually dig into this maps thing a little bit though. Cause Quick I think question. this is an important part. Go ahead. Did you have to do an update on your head unit to get the Google maps satellite view. No. Because this is one of the interesting things that I uh, uh, read early on with uh, CarPlay and Android Audio, Auto is there's almost nothing in the head unit that's specifically uh, you know, uh, doing anything as far as the phone is concerned. It's basically doing a screen share you know, like Miracast or uh, uh, AirPlay to the head unit. There's a bunch of hooks for all kinds of other stuff to get the uh, data to and from, but it's pretty simple as far as that goes. I and mean, it's a lot of work in there, 
but it's you know once they design the spec it's pretty agnostic now that okay. isn't to say that it isn't going to change in the future but at this point it's pretty cool well before we get too far off of this i want to bring up one more point from dnf magazine in the chat he said, talking about using the satellite view to get you to the parking lot, he asked, uh, doesn't that only help if you have the cords to the parking area? Not necessarily, because often what uh, any navigation system is going to do is get you to the street closest to where the cache is. And if the cache is at the other end of the park from the parking lot, it's going to take you the back way and you're going to try to walk through somebody's lot to... Or climb if, fences. Or climb, or climb fences. fences. or Yeah, I'm... I know that's happened. Yeah, actually, it happened yeah. when I was doing all those World Series caches for uh, that was Hidden Creatures mm, back mm -hmm. in June, July. Yeah, something like that. Wow, that was a long time ago. Anymore. I, I, I don't know. I it know was. I was teasing you guys about the fact that I reached the World Turtle before you did, but <laughs> yeah, you did. We're geocachers or geocaching podcasters. We're not supposed to actually go geocaching. We're not allowed to actually. Right. Our accounts yeah. usually get suspended if we have over more five than five cash finds in a week. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, it's like I've, I've uh, done just enough to get the souvenir for this month. I mean, I'm I've scaled back, but that's for different reasons. Yeah, the thing that the uh, uh, satellite maps help with on finding that parking area is typically you have this obvious big slab of blacktop or concrete or these uh, dirt outcroppings off the side of the road with cars parked there. So it's pretty visible on most of the satellite views and it's a good way to find where the parking is. So I'll typically just route to the cache on my, hey, I've got, I want to find a cache over here today, whatever, and I haven't really prepared. I'm just going to go to the uh, satellite view, start driving toward it. And when I get within a mile or so, you start being able to tell where that is. And then so you reach the sign that says private property and realize that, that was actually somebody's happened. driveway. Yeah. And realize, you know, I've spent enough time on this. That I'm going through anyway. Yes. <laughs> so let's get back to the maps though, because I think this is something that makes a difference to a lot of people, myself included. When you're on the uh, phones, Typically, you're getting the maps online and you get the satellite view or street maps. And that's about it. A lot of them have some topo options available now. But I, it's not all of the apps. And if I'm not going to use satellite view when I'm out hiking, I like the topos. So that's one of the advantages of using the GPSR is you can get some really good topo maps the trouble is I don't know that I've found any that I like that are free. Okay. But you don't typically get the satellite view maps on the uh, uh, GPSRs. You can get things like the Garmin bird's eye, but that's a subscription service. And the little bit I've played with it, I was not happy with it at all. Hmm. Yeah, I was trying to remember but I, I had free like topos. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I have seen some free topos, but when I tried them, they weren't very good. And I had a lot of problems getting them onto my GPSR. Yeah. But that kind of stuff does change. But I do like that you can get the open street maps, which are updated regularly for free and drop them onto almost any GPSR at this point. And those are really nice. And a lot of times they will have the trails on them. So that's a big bonus. Really is, yeah. And with the when with my Explorist, um, I I I believe the maps I have on there are Open Street Maps. But I did go through a paid service because they they compiled them in such a way that it was easier for me to load onto the GPSR. Abs yeah, absolutely, and it's worth doing some of that, especially if they're going to be updating it regularly, and you can just log in you know, every couple of months and download the update. That's something that I'd be willing to pay for. Right. Chris, what's your opinion on maps though? I'm, I'm a pro map fan. <laughs> Just any maps. Doesn't matter which. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, 
You know, I don't use topo maps for the most part. I will look at them if I'm on a hike or planning a hike. I tend not to use them during the hike. Um, you know, I want uh, a nice map that's going to show me the trails in the area. So usually something like the uh, uh, open map, um, the cycle maps. Open cycle? Yeah, yeah, open, open cycle. cycle. Yeah. yeah. That that's got a really good trail. Uh, the overhead or uh, bird's eye view is nice, uh, but most of the time, you know, it's either go. Yeah, it's great for urban caching. Oh look, there's a park. Oh look, that's there's a picnic table there. I bet that's where it is. You know, um, but when you're on a long hike in the woods, it really does you no good. Unless no. you can say, oh, look, there's, there's supposed to be a lake over here that we're not going to be able to see. Yeah. Well, it does do that. And, it, and most of the trails, I've actually been able to see the trail in the tree lines. It's it depends. Not, yeah. Yeah. It's not 100%. Mm -hmm. But when I don't have any other trail maps available for it, it does, it does give provide me something stuff. to go from. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So most of the time, I use the um, street maps. Just the plane because they load quickly uh, and update quickly with a little data. So when you're out and about, that's usually, you know, the fastest option. Well, and the nice thing with the uh, open street maps and a lot of the uh, uh, apps is you can actually cache those onto your device. So you don't need to have the data. Mm -hmm. You can turn off the, uh, you know, put it into airplane mode or whatever and go caching without using data if you're trying to conserve data. Or, or if you're out of range. Country or out of range, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. So I I definitely do the uh, um, open street maps on uh, Cachely, though I don't know that I've actually updated those uh, once I changed apps. Because when I switched to the beta program, I don't think I reloaded it. So I kind of go check that out, actually. Yeah, but I, I like having them for Canada, especially. I just load them in and keep them for uh, Ontario because there's a good chance that I'm going to head over to Windsor mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. go caching without, uh, you know, I have to think about it enough to, yeah. like, and bring the passport. Cat. Right. Yeah. Right. But I don't want to have to go find and download those uh, maps, right. you know, at a moment's notice. So I just keep that and uh, uh, my home state and I think I have uh, Ohio because of the uh, uh, mega event that's down there. You know the, um, and it's a great state. It was Geobash. It, it it is a great state that's uh, round on the edges and high in the middle. That's right. Uh, gentlemen, do you use your GPSR units, not a Nuvi, but your GPSR units to navigate? Now the I do have. Outdoors? Yeah. Now on my six hundred, I do have. Is the word navigable maps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the driving maps, yeah. I think, is what yeah. they actually the routable, call them. Routable maps. Right. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so but there's different can, types of routable maps too. That's true. And so not all units support the various ID. types. I don't like it compared to a phone now. When I got it, it was cool. Oh, this is great. But compared to what we have on a phone now, uh, the phone's so much better. Well, I remember one of the big things with the Montana when it came out is it had the option for a dock that would actually mm -hmm. give you the voice prompts. And that was a big, cool thing. But and with the Montana like was the, a big thing. It is still a big thing. Uh, but with like the uh, Oregon, it just, it, it the beeps aren't enough. And it's not a big enough screen that even having it on the dashboard there made for a good navigation experience. So no, I, I I've tried it and didn't like it. So I just never used it. And I, I did have a new I still have a new actually it's sitting at the bottom of my, uh, uh, center console in the car. Cause I just never use it. Yeah. In my case, um, I think the Explorist had the option, but I never use it. Cause I always had a new or Tom Tom that I was using instead. And as Chris knows in my car, I actually use my new as a, as a HUD. Um, just because of where I've got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I used to do that a lot too because it's just handy. But now I've got the phone up there and, <laughs> and I've got the head unit in the, uh, you know, the uh, CarPlay that has the uh, navigation on my current car. 
and I typically just leave it on the uh, uh, dual view screen that it has. So I have the maps with the basic driving info over there and then whatever is playing on the radio on the other side. And I really like having that view and just don't even have the phone connected or turned on a lot of the time. It, 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 there's some issues with CarPlay that uh, kind of annoy me. So I just don't connect the phone if I'm not actually using it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my phone's mounted at a different spot. Um, actually, all of the aftermarket um, radios that I can get for my car that have CarPlay don't have um, are not deep enough are not deep enough to actually also have a CD player in them. Which hmm. I'm old school. I listen to a lot of CDs. And what, what are those? I, I was going to say they're these round things that look sir- like records. So you're supposed to put deposit. those into your phone. They go into your phone and then they go into CarPlay. That's the whole point. Yeah, except that, you know, I end up with a lot of CDs that have not made it into the phone yet because I've just bought them. It's like, oh, I want to listen to them now. But you could buy CDs. Oh, okay. I thought you just picked them up out of the uh, trash after AOL sent them to you. No, not not in this case. I actually, I actually just bought four more <laughs> CDs at a at a festival I was just at. So you get a thousand hours of online what, time what per Coaster CD. Wants to know about Laserdisc, though. Ooh, well, that, now, that's that's uh, you just don't look directly into it because otherwise you hurt your eyes. But you need a really deep dash for those. Yes, yeah, so a really, really you have to you have to go really deep for them. Yes. I love laser discs. I, I, I hate to admit it, but I still love them. I, I had a Disco Vision laser disc player, which I just thought oh, was gosh. Like, Did it come with a mirrored ball that spun on the ceiling? No, 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 no. The The whole point of those Disco Vision ones, I don't know it's actually what their marketing was, but the reason I like these things so much is because the whole disc, it's, it's like those old disc drives for the mainframes where you put this giant disc mm-hmm. in on the... Uh, uh, turntable it would slide it in but it had the like tinted glass uh, cover so oh, it's yes. spinning and it looked like a disco ball i think that's how it got the whole disco <laughs> vision thing. yeah Sorry, my rat hole my aunt had an old rca the old rca disc player that had the they were you actually had to slide oh, the entire thing into it and, C- and it was, ced i think it was called yeah yeah the record player for video right those were it terrible. worked pretty well I most of the time. And when people. they got dirty, it's like, See, yeah, you skipped a bit. Yeah, ours always skipped. Yeah. It just, it was terrible. But at the same but, time, you, you can know, do really cool things like skip tracks. You know, yes. say program this track, this track, this track, and this track. Yeah. No, it, it has, has some cool features, but yeah, oh, it, it just was so bad. <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, nostalgia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tick Magnet said that his uh, Montana does does not do a good job of navigating and takes him on some uh, bizarre routes. And the one thing I will say about that is the navigation on any of these units are only as good as the maps are. And I've had some of the open street maps where one of the builds works perfectly and then I'll try a different build and it has problems getting from one tile to the next. Hmm. I've also had similar problems with some of the official maps. So I think that was on the, one of the Explorers where the tiles didn't load properly. So it jumped back and forth uh, between the base map and the tiles that had loaded correctly. So, you know, you'll, you'll have some issues on the uh, units if the maps have issues. So something you might want to check out. Yeah, you know, if they use the maps from the '80s, you'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day. How many of us, even who you know, drove by maps, could still do that anymore? I still could, but I grew up looking at maps. It was funny because I was, uh, I was just I was at my girlfriend's house last night. She had one of those um, maps. Thomas of guide, San Francisco. Huh? Okay, a Thomas guide. She- no, it was a map of San Francisco is what she had. It was one of those indestructible maps. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, that's old. There's the Embarcadero Freeway that was destroyed in 1989. <laughs> you know, I would I was saying, well, you know, hey, come on. The freeways haven't moved. But in my town, I-5 actually has yeah. rerouted 
a bit. So yeah, no, you yeah. couldn't you yeah. couldn't use it. You can't. Well, you, a lot you, of you, the interchanges have changed, uh, you know, just for congestion or traffic flow reasons. You know, we're getting a lot of traffic circles uh, dropped in all over the place now. Yeah, they're trying to squeeze them in here too. It's uh, yeah. Sometimes they work, but you know, if the road's narrow to begin with, you don't put a traffic circle right where it was. But oh, people want to. Oh, I know they do. Yeah, we've got. I think we still have one in town, and I know in the newer areas of Pleasanton, they've actually incorporated them. Mm-hmm. So, and then you get tire shops right nearby because everybody's hitting the curb <laughs> trying to avoid. It. <laughs> hey, let's open a tire shop. Yeah. Um, but that's a good point. With smartphones, your map updates are, shall we say, included. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. With yeah. GPSR, that is a service that you pay for. So it's important to keep those maps updated. Well, if you're doing the open street maps, you don't necessarily need to pay for them. The well, trouble true. is, I was thinking this the goes back to streets. And right, right. I don't know the, what it's uh, update. Yeah, I can't remember either. The map, I think it's called map update. It, and um, it includes but, bird's eye, so. Well, you get the bird's eye for the first six months or a year when you buy a new unit as well. Yeah, the first so, taste is free. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, this goes back to one of the advantages to a uh, um, smartphone is that it is that data connection that you just jump up on the Wi-Fi even if you don't want to use data and update stuff. Most of the GPSRs, it's an actual process of connecting to a computer and doing the update. You can't update from your smartphone. You can't update from a tablet. It has to be There are a options computer. now, Daryl. You can there actually are. buy like the Garmin 24K Topo Maps on a uh, SD card that you slide in. So that right. can you... And but same those with don't update. City Navigator. No, those don't update. But but you can go buy them. I'm I'm looking. They're they're ninety nine dollars, a hundred dollars is what the yeah. topo maps seem to be, and they're regional. You know, you can get um, southwest, northwest. What, you know. I was just about to say the problem with those is it's uh, not full country mm-hmm. for a continent or anything. Well, it's regional. Although I suspect that they probably have some of those available for like Europe is one ten thousand k, and it's still SD and not USB C. No, yeah, because it's going into your GPSR, and you oh. have to have the GPSR so, that supports it. So you actually have something that still has a SD reader in it. Okay. Well, most well, of the uh, uh, GPSRs are. I yeah. know. That's you have the, the micro SD. Well, your uh, 750 has it. Yeah, my 750 does have it. I've got a, I think I've got an 8K card in it right now, or excuse me, 8 gig card. 8 gig. <laughs> <laughs> it's got 8K. We're showing our age. <laughs> Oh, wow. oh man. Okay. Well, let's let's actually just run down through four of the apps on uh, iOS and Android. Uh, on iOS and Android, both you have the official geocaching app, the geocachinger app, which most of us know. Then the one thing that I will say about that, above everything else, is it does have trail maps as an option. Very nice feature. And the messaging on iOS, feature. And yeah, and we all have to have it on the phone because it has the messaging. Yes. If you don't have it, install it. Don't use it, but install it, lock in, and use it for the messaging. I use it, it for messaging. Handy. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I do as well. And unfortunately, it opens up. It's uh, the default trackables app. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Which so you can't you, change on iOS. So if you get a new uh, cache notice on your phone through text, you click it, it immediately opens the app. Then you have to click the, in the app and go say, go show in browser. And it eventually will. Yeah, exactly. It's annoying. But I like Cashly. That's the one that I use. And most iOS users I know use that one. Yep. Uh, looking for cache is another uh, excellent option on uh, iOS. And the thing that you get with looking for cache that you don't get with the others is multiple accounts. So you can actually put your kids, your wife, your dog. Yeah, your dog, your brother, your sister, whatever. Your trackable car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, because that doesn't have an account if it's trackable. Good. Oh, that's true. Okay. Uh, you if you created an account for your car, yeah, but you know, you put all those uh, accounts in there, and you can log all at once for all of the accounts. 
very awesome handy feature. Yeah, that was, uh, and then, that was my go-to on my iPad until Cashly became iPad compatible as well. Oh, good point. Yeah, it is an iPad. And I think iPad uh, I think all of the non-official geocaching apps are iPad friendly. I don't think that the uh, geocaching official app is no. iPad friendly. It is uh, and then you put uh, GeoBucket in here, which we thought was dead, but it seems to have come back from the uh, dead, uh, Limax. Yeah, it was it was funny because I actually got an update on it. I can't remember when I told you guys. It was it has been about three weeks ago or so. Something like, like that. Geo GeoBucket just suddenly updated, and I'd I'd forgotten I'd left it on my iPad because, well, with with as much memory as it's got, I haven't needed to remove stuff. But <laughs> it is, it's funny. Um, I was telling Daryl this off air. Uh, it was the second geocaching app I ever used. Uh, first one was by Pirates of Oregon or something like that. And that one was long is long gone. Um, but I used this back on my iPad too. And it was what you used back then. And this is before the days of the token where he was actually, he actually had an interface to the web browser that you could then grab it and bring it back into GeoBucket. And um, yeah. I actually went in and I opened it up. And it is so clunky compared to everything else now. <laughs> um, I bring it up and I'm, I'm going, well, where are the geocaches? I actually have to click a button in order to load the geocaches. So it doesn't bring them up automatically like uh, the other ones do. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, way back when, and I, I think I've told the story on here before, GeoBucket, I used GeoBucket to do seat of the pants caching before I could do anything else. Um, and this was a trip I made um, through Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts. I, actually, not Connecticut. Excuse me. Connecticut wasn't part of it because that was in the opposite direction. <laughs> but, I mean, I did four states in a day, and I did it by stopping somewhere, loading the caches on Geo on GeoBucket. From there, uh, putting it into my GPS to then go navigate and find it. So that's, that's quite the, uh, workflow you've got going there. Well, so, okay. This was 2012. Yeah. So I, mean, I, I had to go look at yeah. the geo bucket revision history version 4.8 came out August 19, 2015 mm -hmm. version 4.9 came out February 7th, 2018. And then there's 4.10 September 23rd and 4.11 October 2nd. Okay, so 4.11 was the one that I noticed. I wonder why I didn't get the others. Interesting. And um, they support iPad split screen, iPhone X, or iPhone 10. So <laughs> iPhone X or XS. Well, you have to, you have to actually support iPhone. iPhone 10 to be able to update your app now in the App Store. Mm, makes sense. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I was thinking they probably couldn't, but like uh, Geosphere couldn't update the app because they couldn't update their code base to the current versions of uh, uh, Xcode. So they got forced out because of that. And that's why they had to do the whole rewrite and just, just never happened. Yeah. Let's move on to Android though. We already mentioned the official app, but there's also GC Droid, which is more of a uh, power app for uh, from a uh, local developer here. CGO is the one that everyone that I know on Android sends to use, but I, I, I can't really recommend that because it does do scraping. Geocaching.com's position is basically we're looking the other way, but don't expect us to make sure it continues to work. And when they change the website, it does frequently break CGO. That yeah, said, it does things that no one else can do because they're not limited by the API. Yeah, so ahead, like they didn't want to, they didn't, from what I understand, they didn't want to alienate a lot of the Android users that use CGO by um, looking right at it. Yeah. So, yeah, it does break your terms of service. But mm -hmm. so many people use it. It's the mainstay of uh, Android caching, so they really can't do too much about it. Uh, another one we've uh, had on the show a few times uh, is uh, GeoLive, which is definitely an app for people to look at. And it has some uh, 
cool features you won't find in the other ones, including a where I go player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the ones you've that done a lot of work there. on GeoLive. I've I've been impressed with it as of late. Yeah. 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 It, it's a nice app. Uh, I I haven't used it recently because I haven't used much on uh, Android, but I I think that's the one I recommend most because it is a free app that does most of what most geocachers I know need, and it does not do the scraping like CGO. Yeah, I'm going to have so to go Cashly back. Cashly on iOS yeah. and uh, GeoLive on Android that I recommend. Yeah, I've got um, yeah, I've got my son's old uh, Samsung S4 that I keep in the car, and I just, just realized I need to get in on Wi-Fi and update things on it again and make sure that I've got things up to date on it. You know, I got it mainly so I could do ANT Plus with it. So, mm -hmm. so we've talked about iOS and Android. Can't forget Windows Phone. Well, yes, oh, we yeah, can, we can. it's no longer supported. <laughs> Wait a minute, I thought the width end was still using Windows Phone. Uh, no. No? No, he's still using the original Nokia, the uh, the one with the round keypad. The one with the rotary dial on it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. It was known as the uh, birth control phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah. Uh, let's move into the GPSRs because we are getting long and we've got more stuff to talk about. Uh, <laughs> the uh, GPSRs, really, at this point, it's just Garmin that's still out there. So you have the or yeah, you have the uh, Oregon uh, 700 and 750, which we already um, talked a little bit about. Uh, Montana line is still in production. The uh, the 610 and 680, or well, you know what? I shouldn't say still in production, but still listed on the website as a current product. Yeah. Uh, E-Trex, you have the 10, the 20X, and the 30X. The 30X is the one that's the current version of my 30, and that's the one I tend to recommend most because it's an, as a second unit because it's a small GPS. It's handy. Uh, it works really well for me. Um, we, we didn't get into it at all, but I'm going to mention it now. The quad helix antenna that you have on your better GPSRs are awesome when you're in the uh, woods. In the city, they tend to be worse because they'll pick up more of the refractions. So if you're doing primarily uh, the woods or uh, you know back country stuff, you definitely want to get a unit that has like the quad helix. However, for general use, I tend to like the uh, Etrex 30 style, the ceramic antennas in there, a little bit better. And I like physical buttons rather than touch screen on my GPS because I can use them with gloves and I don't have to worry about uh, uh, water and rain accidentally activating or blocking out your touches. Well, that's why you need a resistive touch rather than, re than a reactive touch. The capacitive touch, yes. Capacitive, capacitive reactive, yeah. tomato, tomato. <laughs> uh, but the there is an e-trex touch so if you really like the touch screen you can get the 25 and the 35 which are essentially the same product as the uh, e-trex just with the touch screen instead of the buttons and joystick then there's the gps map 64 and 66 uh, the 66 is essentially from what we can tell the 750 functions with the buttons and no touchscreen. So interesting. I actually tried we are, we to want see, see if I could get my hands on one and try it out. Um, REI was back ordered for some reason. Hmm. Yeah, so. it, it, that tends to happen with the uh, new Garmin units because people are all excited because it's years between updates. And a lot of those people with 64s are trying to get the 66, expecting it to be you know, the next latest and greatest version but the teardowns uh as i understand it are not showing that it has that quad helix antenna that made these 60 series so famous it's uh some weird ceramic antenna i believe yeah i think that's what uh on the one that i think i sent you had that it's like and i'm thinking to myself don't drink the kool-aid yeah so it, this is uh, not going to be the signal uh, um, uh, sucker that the uh, rest of the series is from what we're seeing. 
And the reviews that I've seen from people who have gotten it are mixed at best. They're not seeming to like it. So I think we might have another wait and see on the uh, 66. But it's the only uh, one that does all three navigation systems, though, currently, isn't it? I believe it is, but I'm not 100% sure that the 750 doesn't. I don't remember, but I well, think I it mean, is. The, the 750, I know, does GLONASS, at least. I don't know if it does Galileo. It does. Well, all almost all of these will do the uh, GLONASS and GPS. The Galileo, I think, was... Uh, capable on the uh, 750, but not enabled. Mm-hmm. It had to be enabled in firmware because Galileo wasn't uh, live at that point. Well, maybe so maybe we should find one that does uh, does the Baidu system too, though. Yeah, I don't know of any that do the Baidu system because that's only in China. Right, and, and it was in China it, it, you're not allowed to have the GPS system. So, I think there's some legal issues if you know, if you were to try to do that as a citizen and i don't really know right and it's an was interesting it, question the japan was a jsat is what i want to say yeah J-star. that's that's like a uh um what do they call it it's an augmentation system or something it's okay. it's not primary it's to help improve the um, gps signal i believe Oh, kind so of like it, um, Del- oh, not Delorm. Uh, Waz. Waz. Out of, yeah. I was trying to think of the the ground based system that I've talked about before that I've just forgotten oh. the name of Loran. Loran, yeah, yeah. Well, Loran was actually its own system, wasn't it? It was. It was its own system. Yeah. And it, they were all, but they were all ground based antennas. Right. Right. I so thought like, it was Waz just, is ground based. Yeah, Waz is ground based. I thought Loran was mainly for C. It was mainly for sea, but it's also used for aircraft navigation as well. Okay. Right. Anyway, and the last of the uh, Garmin units we want to mention is the Rhino. They have the 700, the 750, and the 755. Those are kind of cool units in that they have the radio, the uh, walkie-talkie built in. And the thing I liked about those was you can send over the radio your location and ping other people for their locations. So it's a nice thing to have as a group going out on the uh, trail. As long as you had a GMRS license, yeah. Uh, well, you can't actually turn off the GMRS on those oh, yeah, and just go to FRS, just FRS. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but then you're stuck with a little bit shorter range. Right. Then there's the Magellan Explorer series, which is no longer technically available, but you can still find some of those units around. Yeah, they are still around. They're They're harder to find these days. That's... Of course, it's still my go-to unit because Garmin has um, <laughs> gone downhill in my eyes. I mean, okay, I'm still using one of their car nav units, but that's because my Tom Tom died and decided to get one similar to the one my wife had, so I could help her when she was having trouble. But, well, and one of the uh, interesting things is most of those uh, Explorers series, the uh, you know whatever hundreds, uh, were actually Windows CE based. Yes, which I were. think might be part of its downfall. Uh, yeah. And then we also want to mention the uh, Delorme PN series. Delorme is now owned by Garmin, and those units were discontinued. But the forty was the PN forty was the best, best accuracy of, of any of the uh, GPSs I've ever had. Yeah. Well, was, like dead on. And the PN sixty has to be mentioned because it was um, uh, linked with the InReach. At the time, right? Yep. And now the yep. inReach is owned by in-reach. Garmin, right? Yeah, right. But not the. But they had the PN60 for a while because it was, you know, the. I I forgot what type of communication they used. Well, actually, that one I, that one didn't uh, tie to the inReach. It had, actually no, it did. It had the option for the inReach. Yeah. But they had a, a communication yeah. system, and it actually tied to a special version of the Spot Messenger too. So before they came out there with the go. inReach, yeah, right. yeah, you're right. they had the spot, and then they came out with their own just black box uh, inReach. Now you have the inReaches that have the screens and full-out GPSRs uh, that are inReach. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I haven't seen anyone actually caching with one, and I would like to try that. I think for me, if I was able to ever get an inReach, I would use it as a supplement, supplemental 
thing. It would be there just in case I get myself into trouble. Well, which of <laughs> well, they have the two different versions of the inReach. They have the I think it's called the SE, yeah. which is basic messaging, basic location. It doesn't really not do anymore. The GPS there's, stuff, there's just the inReach Mini. What? Really? Yeah. I just I'm looking at. I those. just saw the uh, listing when I was putting together the links for the show. They had uh, the uh, inReach. I see the inReach uh, in Mini. the two different flavors. Oh, you, there is a full inReach. Yeah, it's inReach. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's an inReach. You're right. Yeah. So it's just the inReach the mini now. SE plus. You're. I'm. I apologize. Okay. I was thinking yeah. the SE was the small one, and it's not. The I was the SE plus is the mini. one I want. Yeah, it was um, the one I was looking at. The SE plus, which is a full GPS, uh, is four hundred dollars, and I want to say the mini is like three seventy nine. But you do have to have the service if you're looking yeah. to get the satellite two way which is the whole point of those things if you are going out of range and hiking in the backcountry or going off roading or you know if you're um going yachting or something those are lifesavers literally yes it is worth spending the uh, cash to get the subscription at least the basic one and have the rescue services and to have the option to say hit this button and send a message to my wife that everything's okay or to my parents or whatever so that you have someone back on land who can keep track yeah it's it would be a really good thing to have and you know of course i'm not going to be doing any hiking around here anytime soon but uh going back to the back country that would be a better thing for me to have yeah uh gsm times two says the inreach mini is fabulous he's a huge fan but he also wanted to know if having more signal sources increases accuracy or just confuses that unit. His experience is that they tend to bounce around a lot uh, as he looks at his tracks. And I believe because of what he's talking about, uh, or the way he's talking about it, he's talking about like the quad helix versus a ceramic. I would it's be not almost... Someone... Go ahead. I was going to say, well, you know, the quad helix, we've already said, it's going to have some issues, you know, when you've got a lot of things to reflect off of. Right. Whereas the ceramic, and it's, a, even it's in, a single unit. So it's, yeah, it's a single antenna. It's getting signals from one set of, you know, it's, it's a, it's a weaker antenna essentially. Yeah. But by having that stronger antenna, antenna, it has a harder time differentiating between the direct signals and the refracted signals. So yes, you will see more problems. Now, as far as using GLONASS or Galileo to refine the signal, that should improve the uh, accuracy. And that's been my experience. With WAS, I actually had the opposite effect where on the older units, and I haven't really paid much attention with the newer units but on the older units enabling WAS decreased my accuracy hmm. Hmm. so there you go <laughs> that's my two cents on it yeah. uh, alright we are running long but let's mention a couple of apps because if you do have a GPSR you're going to need to get the caches onto it, and that's not necessarily so simple. Unless you are using a Garmin, you can use a geocaching website. Yay! Yes, yes, which isn't so simple, but it, it still works. It it's it's a nice tool to have, especially for like the FTFs. But the other thing is with the geocaching website, if you're a premium member, you can do your pocket queries and just drag and drop them into the GPX directory, which is what I tend to do. Mm. Uh, if you have like the 750 or the 66, you can also download those uh, uh, pocket queries over Wi-Fi when you're at home. So that's really handy. I like doing that. Uh, but GSAC on Windows is your waypoint management tool and lets you load stuff in and do a whole bunch of other stuff. And then iCaching, if you're on Mac OS, will do um, a lot of those same functions. On the web... You have project-gc.com, fabulous site for managing your uh, fines and helping you to plan trips, uh, no, plan caching outings with other people. That's what I want to say. Cashtour.no 
is the one that's perfect for planning trips. That's also a web resource and a, and a phone resource as well. Yes. Now those won't let you load the caches into the uh, GPSR, but they will create the uh, uh, GPX files that you can load into that and into most of the smartphone apps. Of course, yeah. the official geocaching er app doesn't support those GPX files. So that, mm, yeah, doesn't really work. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons why I never recommend the geocaching er app because most of the bigger events around here give you a GPX file that has unpublished caches. So you can't find them at all with the uh, official app. No, it makes sense. Publified. Uh, I thought you could. Nope. With the okay. old version, you could. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I know Android. I've done it once. Yeah, only on Android. They had it in the iOS version for a little while and then pulled it back out. Oh, interesting. Oh, and we still need to answer uh, Tick Magnet's question about did I get my um, Oregon 750 taken care of? The answer is no. Um, I'm still using it as a doorstop. It keeps my my door nice and wide open at this point. <laughs> um, and I just updated mine to uh, 4.2 right before the show, so I haven't used it to see if it's uh, actually functioning I, yeah, correctly. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Seriously, I'm trying to remember where I put it at this point. Um, I, I got so disgusted with it after it, it would turn off the moment I tried to use it that uh, I probably stuck it in some off. corner somewhere. So, and I've, I've been trying to use the uh, 750 myself. Just can't bring myself to do it because it's so frustrating. But I use it with the um, uh, Bluetooth off. Uh, I do load it with Wi-Fi to get the caches onto it before I leave. But using the uh, live connection stuff has just been frustrating more than anything else. So yeah, I, that... I just don't do it. Yeah, and this is why I'm still using my Explorers 510. I can actually get that thing to work the way I want it to. Um, some of the assumptions that Garmin made, even with the UI in the GPS in the 710, the 750, excuse me, defies all reason. Yeah. Um, I mean, it says, okay, do you want to go to the next nearest cache? I say, yes. It says, okay, here it is. Whereas the Explorist 510 says, okay, you want to go to the next nearest cache? Here's a list of the next nearest caches. Which one do you want to go after? Because sometimes the next nearest cache happens to be a mystery that I haven't solved. So. Yeah, or, you know, it's the nearest cache, but I'm heading north and I don't want to head south just yet. Right, exactly. It, it's, um, it makes some assumptions that are questionable. Mm-hmm. Well, it makes assumptions. Period. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't give you the control that well, control's a good thing as long as I have it. It must it must be the uh the apple of the GPS world. Because giving people control is a bad thing. Yes. Well they're they're going to do things that they shouldn't be doing. To give you an idea how long it's been that I've used the uh seven fifty. I'm playing with it over here trying to figure out how to get uh pocket query back on and I can't remember how to do it. That would, that, uh, that, that kind of does it right there. Yeah. But uh, okay. so yeah, I, I love my, uh, yeah, I love my 30. It, I, I use yeah. that one still. Mostly it just goes out with me as a necklace, but I, I still carry it with me, especially if I'm going to be placing geocaches. I prefer to do it on the GPSR. However, I'm spoiled that I have a bunch of GPSRs and I go out with multiple units. Usually at this point, it's just two, but I go out with multiple units, get readings from both, and I get the reading from the uh, iPhone. And I take all of those and average them so that I get the best possible location for all people who are going to find that cache. All righty, around here, you're not a real geocacher if you don't have a GPSR and a carabiner somewhere on your backpack. <laughs> you don't have to turn it on, but you have to have one. You have to have a backpack? Say, you, have to, you have to have the GPSR on the backpack? Yes. 
So you can't actually use the GPSR. It's just there for decoration. Right, exactly. Yeah. So in that case, just get the uh, eTrex 10. It's the cheapest. Well, actually, why don't you just get one that uh, looks like a GPS that actually doesn't work, you know, like one of the floor models. Like a candy phone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah one of the ones that has the sticker on the front so it looks like it's turned on and routing. Yeah, there you go. Hey, exactly. Your, your GPS is on. You're going to kill the batteries. Oh, no, I get great battery life with this one. <laughs> 30-year battery life. Yeah. Well, right, Limax, well, Limax, thanks for joining us. And hopefully uh, people got some good insight out of this. And if you so. have anything that you'd like to contribute, please email us at geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com. And when we have a randomized show in a couple of weeks, we can uh, share that with everyone. But you know what? You don't have to wait a couple of weeks to hear us. In fact, this Monday, yes, Monday, 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 you can hear us. If you're a patron on our dedicated patron hangout, we're going to have that Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're in the middle, it's somewhere in between. What is that in British pounds? Uh, 17. Got it. <laughs> oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. But we have a lot of great shows coming up. Next week is going to be our gear number four, which is our Thanksgiving show. That's going to be with uh, Land Monkey and C. Michelle. So we're going to take a look at uh, what's in each of our caching bags, what we carry with us. They're all, uh, and neither one of those celebrate U.S. Thanksgiving, so it's fine. Which is, which is why they're on the yeah. show. We're very <laughs> thankful for international hosts. Yes. Uh, and then on the 29th is going to be our next randomized show. And patrons, remember that every randomized show, we have the bonus show afterwards. So you get two shows for the price of one. Then on December 6th, our first show in December, we're going to have uh, any love from Geocaching HQ, but we're going to be two hours early. So mark your calendars for two hours ahead of our normal show time. I'd love love. Yes, she's always a great one to have on the show. Lovely. What's not to love? And I, th I think we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the souvenir for the last of the souvenirs for the uh, new series. So... I'm excited to find out what that's going to be about. But on the 13th, we've got C. Nelson and Teus back, which means we're talking about 3D printing once again. Because we love 3D printing, but not as much as we love the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com. For more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes for this and all our episodes now. Here's the part, because we love hearing from our listeners. So leave us feedback by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through the many channels of social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. The show is copyright 2018 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. Cash with the Cash Media. Yes.